In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicast. Cast, the official podcast of Bundablog.com, the home of all the creeps and crawls and things that go bump in the night. I am your host, Steve, and with me today is the hauntedly delicious Danielle. Delicious. Well, that's that's all like that's all they <laughs> serve the cereal. cereal. <laughs> oh yeah, it's hauntedly oh, delicious. Oh yeah, sweetest things. Yeah, that, okay, I appreciate it. Halloween that. cereal is a very you know is a is a niche that I isn't accept celebrated that compliment enough as both a double entendre and as a breakfast cereal. So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the Count Chocula of podcast champions is with us, D Rock. <laughs> How you doing, D Rock? What's up, D Rock here? Um, and Spooktober rolls on our halloween marathons continue into the month and i am having a great time distracting myself from the universe we're going pretty ham yes just dipping into the waters of (laughs) spooky movies our family members are concerned (laughs) every morning there they wake up and they're like Every time I look up at like Twitter, Instagram, there's like a new uh, movie poster being posted. Like, We're watching this movie. I'm like, damn. What's funny is that if I had done this for the entirety of 2020, um, oh my it would be even We're more. Hundreds of movies. Because we, we have watched hundreds. We have movies. watched hundreds. At, at, there was one point it's at this so quarantine bad. that we were watching three movies a day, day. like three yeah. brand new movies. Yep. Wow. Every single day. I probably can remember none of them at this point. Like I feel yeah. like no, there were some good ones. Like the Oath was really good. That's available on Hulu. And it's this not political that they're time. bad. It's just that there's so many movies. It's sort of a I... political thriller horror movie, yeah. but it's totally a comedy. It's it's very good. The Oath. Um, what is that one? That's. It stars Ike Barinholtz and Tiffany Haddish. And he wrote and directed it. And they're like a, a married couple. And there is a... They live in a uh, society that's very much like our own, where their president has decided that he wants an oath of fealty to him. Oh my God. Uh, and if you sign this oath, you get a tax break, and you get yeah. all this incentive, wow. and you get better citizenship. It's like way too relevant right now. <laughs> People are well, divided about this at Thanksgiving what's funny and it turns is, is that bloody. When when the movie came out at the time, people didn't really pay attention to it and they kind of like poo pooed it. But I think it just it came out in twenty sixteen. I think it just came I out mean, like three years oh. too early. Like I think that if it had yeah. come out this year, um <laughs> people would be yeah, the buzz would hands. be really good. Like, and, people would be shooting their hands. And Tiffany, uh, Tiffany Haddish is in it, and she's really good. She gives yeah. a really good performance. Yeah. And yeah. she's very much at the center of, like, this white family uh, Thanksgiving, and she's the only black person, and everyone's yeah, like she married talking about white all this family. political stuff, and yeah. she's just trying to, like, keep her head down and, like, right. not deal with it. It's a really, really entertaining movie. Yes. And it is kind of horror-ish. Yeah. Right. Just not, you know, dragging yeah. Yeah, no, it's not Dracula. Yeah, oh my god. We'll get to Dracula. Oh my god, that movie. <laughs> so much Dracula. So let's let's start off with Bram Stoker's Dracula. That's the perfect transition. Okay, yeah, let's do it. 
So we watched that for our Drac Attack Day, which was yeah, we did. But we didn't. When did we watch? We watched. Oh, for Gothic Day. I'm we sorry. We watched it for Gothic Day. Literally every other Dracula movie for Drac Attack Day. <laughs> yeah, no, we we watched we watched it for Gothic Day because it's like the, one of the most gothic things I've ever watched in my oh, whole life. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it was very interesting watching that film and how he had, how we had watched Sleepy Hollow on day one, oh, and yeah. seeing the ways that at that same you know sort of time period they were mimicking all of these older styles of yeah. horror and like yeah. sets and like lighting. Now that we watched a lot of like old school horror movies, you can see the way that they just blatantly like took homaged these old to these stories like um bloody like black sunday and black sunday yeah okay um so right. ram service dracula well this, I just it, like the the, the 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 one thing i took i made some notes before we before we did this so i could like do stuff um the the only note that i have for this movie is that it's the most extra movie maybe I've ever seen in my life. It's just so, everybody's just fucking hamming it up and Gary Oldman is just going all out and it's so delightful. It's not what I expected it to be. For some reason, I don't know why. First time you've ever seen it? Yeah, this is the first time I've seen it. Wow. And for some reason, I thought this was like a more like serious minded, I don't know if it's, you thought it'd be more brooding and like... Or if it's the fact that it's Francis Ford Coppola. But for some reason, I thought this was like a somber, like very serious take on Dracula. No, and it, Gary Oldman always brings the hand. No, Gary Oldman's like a pretty serious actor when he wants to be like... Yeah, but he really... He likes the hand. But, but when you put Gary Oldman in the middle of a movie, yeah. Gary Oldman is going to play it up. Yeah, like okay, mm -hmm. he whenever he's a star in a movie, he always seems to like just like throw himself into the performance like so deeply, um, and he's definitely mm -hmm. one of the funnest parts of this movie is watching all of his yeah. different transformations, and as we were watching, we were looking up trivia, and we were finding out that he really got into the whole makeup aspect, and he spent weeks before the movie came out thinking of new makeup designs with the makeup artists of what they could do to him. That's and cool. So that was super, super fun. Yeah, all of his different looks and, like, iterations and stuff is just, like, so delightful. The one, thing, the one complaint I have about this movie is, like, the timeline. Oh, well, like... I think the timeline was more confusing when I didn't realize that the younger version of himself in that's in the present i didn't realize that was the present because he was so young but he just like youngified himself yeah he, he like I made him that was like oh okay yeah yeah but I, my my one i think my one note this time around because i've watched this movie a lot and i really like this movie and yeah. we got to watch the uncut version and it was really funny because steven couldn't find this dracula and i kept telling him I think you need to search for Bram Stoker's Dracula. And he was like, no, no, no. It should show up anyway. And sure, It should come up when you find the Dracula. sure enough, he was like trying in vain. And then I just took the remote and I said, Bram Stoker's Dracula. And it popped up. And I'm like, I told you. They're very serious about this. They want you to know it's Bram Stoker's Dracula. Which but I think is audacious. Okay? <laughs> First of all. That's like if they. I think that's amazing. That's like if they called. They're totally. They're totally, they're totally, they're totally separate. In this <laughs> they totally separated themselves from every other Dracula movie because you can't just search no. Dracula. If you just say Dracula, a million Christopher Lee yeah. movies they, pop up. Francis but if you Ford have Coppola. to search Bram Stoker's Dracula if you really want the good stuff, that Gary Oldman werewolf sex in the moonlight stuff. That's what you gotta search. I think that's also part of why I expected this to be a little bit more serious is because <laughs> Bram Stoker, like I thought like this would be like, this is the truest like representation of the source material. But maybe it, I have never the read The material is campy as hell, yeah. It oh is. really? Okay. Yeah, well, campy as okay. hell. It, yeah, it should I, be I, called I It should be called Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, okay? 
That's as if oh, that's as if they called it George Lucas's The Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> okay? This is insane. Oh. Bram Stoker's dead. It should be called Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's <laughs> Dracula. Dracula. Then you'll never find it. I'll ever. accept it. So my one note for this movie, watching it again, was the amount of writhing that occurred. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, should we get a writhing count at this point? Like, how much? Like, you did a drinking game. Take a shot every time someone's By the time she'd talking. said that, there'd already been at least eight to ten writhing <laughs> scenes. <laughs> like, there's so much rhyming going on in that movie. Oh, the other thing I noticed was the, like, after watching this movie, I was really, like, s- amused by how super accurate the Simpsons parody of this is. Like, with all the, like, the, like, stuff of, like, Burns' shadow on the wall, like, like doing a yo-yo and, like, doing all this <laughs> It's just like that. He's just like always like his shadow is like doing some crazy shit on the wall. It's hilarious. I think this viewing, the thing I appreciated most was Anthony Hopkins's performance. Yeah. Like he really. He with the best of them as well. He is enjoying being Van Helsing. He was, yeah. yeah. He really He's is. like, finally, I'm never going to be Superman. I'm never going to be Batman, but God damn it, I'm Van Helsing. <laughs> yeah. I was so excited about it. And though his character, just the way he played him, yeah, he with like a slight. I guess I I think he played him with a little bit like with that. What, what was that one movie we saw with the Van Helsing esque character? Was it? He's a little unhinged. Yeah. Are you talking about Dracula? Yeah, we watched another Dracula. Did we have watch another Dracula that had Van Helsing? That was yeah, kind the of- Dracula two thousand had. No, 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 no. It was an. And old then we watched one. Horror of Dracula, starring Christopher Lee. Yeah. And Peter Cushing. Yeah. And that Van Helsing was very, which, like, stern. Who was, which, who played the Van Helsing in that? Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing, thank you. I think he was doing a little bit of a Peter Cushing, in my opinion. But then, like, he turned it up a notch and did some cocaine. And then he was like, okay, I got my part. I know what I'm doing. So. <laughs> you, I, mean, I, I don't know how to transition from <laughs> Van Helsing doing cocaine. I, uh, yeah, I really like the movie. I think this is the one time that I really appreciate Anthony Hopkins, really soaked him in, really snorted the him one up. one time? Well, this is the time that I really enjoyed Anthony Hopkins a lot. Okay. This is the time. This is the I'm one. not allowed to enjoy him this time? No, I'm just saying, like, you've seen so many of his other performances, Silence of the Lamb. No, but I mean, in this specific movie, oh, why are movie. you in this minutia? Huh? I don't know. Oh, in this, yeah, Okay. What was the theme when you saw Dracula? Do you remember? That's that was kind of like I was I, I I kind of was thinking about doing it for Gothic, but then I was like, it was Vampire Day, and I've never seen Bram Stoker's Dracula, and I was like, I got to do Bram Stoker's Dracula for Vampire Day. So I'll do I'll figure something else out for Gothic. So we're doing the Nightmare on Film Street podcast list, and they have back to back days. Gothic was one day. And then the next day was Drac Attack. So oh, we wow. got like a lot of Stephen vampires back to back to back Stephen to back. You guys are irritated by that. I, I am that. irritated by that because they have that back to back. They have Good Witch and Bad Witch back to back. Oh, yeah. That's like, you too should, much of one thing. You should spread out these movie types, mm-hmm. okay? So that the whole month is a Neapolitan. That's kind of why I liked the I, why I like the one that I that I'm doing right now because all all the all the themes are very specific. Like all they're like all like different types of horror movies. You know, supernatural, true story, psychological possession, vampires. Today was creepy kids, so uh, that's that's fun. Um, but they're like, you know, the, and it's all, it's all different. Everything's, di- you know, B movies and, and demons and all kinds did of stuff. Did you start watching Haunting of Blind Manor for creepy kids? Cause I think that's totally appropriate. I did and not on purpose, but like it, it, it came <laughs> out hey, it's creepy kids day. So I like, I started watching it. Like as soon as I woke up, I only got one episode in, but only like yeah, two it's perfect for creepy kids day. Yeah, like, we're like two or three in, so we won't spoil anything. We won't talk about it cause it's so right. good. But we're enjoying it. Yeah. There, there's been some people that are down on it, but I'm I'm digging it. People are I like, think it's not as scary as the 
us caught right. in the jailhouse. I think, yeah, the main, the main thing that has people kind of down on it, which is, I mean, and that's, that's kind of a, you know, that's going to happen with horror fans is they, some of them tend to be a little too attached to things being scary. And I think from it's creepy as hell. This, huh? I think it's creepy as hell. Yeah, it's creepy. It's just like, it's not, they get, be like, horror fans tend to get up their own asses about things being technically horror or not. Yeah. And it's like, whatever, if it's good, like, from what I've read in the reviews, like, this is, this is a less horror-esque. It is. Uh, than, than Hill House. Um, but it's, so, it's actually more gothic, I would argue. It's more, oh, like, yeah. romantic, like, gothic, kind of, so far. Yeah, I can see that. So what was your creepy kids pick? So I had a bunch of creepy kids movies actually, and uh, I might try to do one or two more after this. But so far, other than uh, *Blind Manor*, uh, the only creepy kids movie I've watched is *Ringu*, the original Japanese uh, ring movie. Which um, I might get some shit for this, but like I wasn't super impressed. Um, oh, maybe, I agree with you. I think, the re- I think the, no, I actually think the American remake's better, in my opinion. I think so too. Like, I I don't know. Maybe it's because I saw that one first and like Possibly. went. Before. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's just like I've heard this debate for years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just, you know what, you know what so it is. People have said that like the the original is so much better, and I don't really see it. I just like I don't know the the effects in the remake are like a million times better, which makes everything so much more visceral and real. I would actually I would argue that okay I think I I would say actually that I think Samara in Ringu is more scary. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. in like in terms of when they finally show her face, because they right. never really totally show her face, I think that's Die. more effective. Yeah. But I think that the American remake has such a better sense of pacing. Yes. And, and like, there's this weird kind of thing in the Japanese thing, and maybe it's a cultural difference that I just didn't get, but I don't think so, because I've watched a lot of other Japanese movies and enjoyed them and horror yeah. and stuff. But there's just something in that movie that with this need to like explain everything with this really like strange philosophical like long-winded monologues about like stuff. That's what I can remember about it. I was like, why is there so much monologuing in this horror yeah. movie? And I think that that like took away the tension for me. Like, yeah, I just, I really prefer the way the American version paced itself and set everything up. And the American version is such a, it's like, it's a, one of my favorite examples of a, a horror drama. Mm-hmm. The way that movie combines the, those two things, like, like Hill House, like Hill House is like, like a perfect horror drama. Yeah. And The Ring is like one of, one of my favorite examples of horror drama, because it really, I mean, from, from the beginning where like some horror happens up until like, like stuff starts happening towards the end it's really a drama you know it's a family drama it's about her and her kid and her her ex-husband and you know her investigation of what happened to this girl and blah 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 and like i what you said is is spot on i think the pacing is just like night and day between the two films i think I'm going to be blasphemous, but I've always felt that The Ring and Ringu are both overrated. Oh! Um, I'm that guy. There you go. But I don't really care enough to start a fight. So <laughs> Is I, well, what I thought you were going to say for Creepy Kids was The Omen. Yeah, I mean, that would be that would be a perfect, but I kind of, you know, it was Possession Day, and I kind of, we just like, I don't know, I wanted to I wanted to, and I think I think it, part of it was because I had so many things that I wanted to watch for Creepy Kids Day that I was trying to get other things off of that day and try to put them on other days that they would qualify for. So I ended up doing The Omen. The, the other thing that I w- kind of wanted to do, but like probably won't get to it, was The Exorcist. I mean, that's, talk about like the ultimate creepy kid movie. Mm-hmm. Like, 
that's I mean Linda Blair's you know just you know yeah incredible so you um, saw the omen for possession day yeah I saw the omen for possession that was the only one I did for possession day I think what did you think of the omen uh it was actually the second time I've seen it but it was the first time in like probably close to 15 years so it was pretty much I was pretty much going in fresh for the most part I kind of knew somewhat but um it's a, it's a great movie. I mean, The Omen is a great movie. I feel like there's this kind of almost like unholy trinity of like three like major horror movies that are sort of universally accepted as like, you know, capital actual good movies. Mm -hmm. The Exorcist and The Omen, I feel like are those kind of three movies that everyone kind of tends to agree. These are like actual good movies outside of the horror genre. And I think with good reason, because all three of those movies are like spectacular and The Omen, The Omen, there's just so much going on and it all comes together so well in the performances. Gregory Peck is, um, the kid is fucking amazing. So terrifying, yeah. And then you just see how so many movies have just ripped off the omen yeah. over and over and over, over and, and over and over and over and over. Oh, for sure. Um, we we dining. <laughs> I wanted to revisit your point about how, like, I mean, and there could be like whole episodes about this, but I just to shortly revisit the idea that like horror, there are really just some horror fans who get really weird and like up in their feelings about what constitutes horror and what doesn't mm -hmm. and it's such a funny thing to me because I, the other day i saw a tweet and i completely agree with it that was like horror is horror the, this person completely and i agree with them that the horror is the most versatile genre it can bleed into anything so yeah. it's so funny to see how those two schools of because there really is those two schools of thought fighting against each other right. and i and i actually i think that like for horror people as i know it's like subjective and they can they can decide that but i actually think that they they shoot themselves in the foot when they don't think about how really broad horror can be, you know, yeah. like, and, and I, I don't know. I just, I, I know I get so like bored of the same kind of thing. Cause there's some people who think horror is only a slasher movie and like yeah. slasher movies to me get so boring, yeah. you know, and I get so, I, I get over them so quickly cause it's, a, it's, it's the same beats over and over and over again. And, and I, I really, that's why I like, I really like branching out into horror that's like so much more psychological, but yeah. Sometimes you just want to hear some people play the drums, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think the, the con, the concept of horror itself is subjective in a way, like, you know, horror is just whatever scares, disturbs, unsettles, a given person and every person that's different for every person. Yeah. So I think not only is it versatile, but it's, it can be very amorphous. And like you said, bleed into so many other things. I mean, you can use, there's, there's tons of films that have used elements of horror that are not horror movies, like yeah. that no one would call a horror movie, but they like, you know, there are certain, you know, techniques and, you know, kind of cadences and ways of you know pacing things and th filming things that are very horror but never get it's the kind of it's kind of the same thing with like you know the elements of like Sergio Leone can be found in like thousands of films that are not even close to westerns Western, yeah you know and I think I think what I've realized is for me my favorite horror has to have a mystery in it mm. i like a mystery because i i think that's i think it makes it unsettling because there's there's knowledge that you don't have that you need to have to figure out what's going on and it's kind of like a race to know will they figure it out before it's too late so you like a will, puzzle yeah it's like a puzzle that they constantly have I, I don't know that that's that's why i like ghost stories because a lot most of the time in the in the ghost horror genre it tends to have a mystery like why did this person die and and where are they and why does this ghost what does this ghost want like that question 
which versus like slasher movies for me, which very much are not just like, nah, he's going to stab people. <laughs> he he well, wants to stab. And, and to your point, like, what is the greatest fear of all? Fear of the unknown. And so a mystery yeah. taps right into that. And I think, I like, I mean, if you went through the horror genre, I think most horror movies on some level, I think, have some kind of mystery. At yeah. least at the beginning, you're, you're, like, you're like, not knowing what's going on is almost a quintessential part of horror cinema and and when you actually it's funny when you said that i was like oh you should watch house on haunted hill because that is like i don't know if you maybe you've seen it but um, the original, original the old school the original movie? the 1959 no i've never seen it and it, honestly, it, it looks scary to me i you know there was not, one scene it, it's really more campy than anything yeah, nowadays, it's uh, really good camp there's a, it's a, it has a great mystery with a lot of twists. Vincent Price is fucking, you know, talk about hamming it up. I mean, nobody does it better. Um, also, the the woman that plays his wife, Carol Omar, is so hot. It is <laughs> not even fair. Oh my god, <laughs> that's my endorsement for. That's why I watched on I'll Super. Hear that now and get it. Right after we we did our last podcast. Yeah. on my supernatural day so we also saw some omen movies but we saw omen 2 and omen 3 yeah because we had already seen the omen a few months earlier okay and it's there's no mysteries in them no none <laughs> definitely yeah. probably satan's kid slash satan <laughs> yeah and the Bible is the one that spoiled it. It's, okay? we, it's weird oh, really? because like the next two Omen movies, Omen two and three, are just nothing but Damien constantly winning. So I'm oh, like, who, what were the, who were these movies it's, made for? It's, because it's, it's like, just people being like, oh my god, I think Damien's Damien the, the devil, and then something horrible what happens, happens to them. Like it's die. almost like yeah. Final Destination. It is. It is. It's very much Final yeah. Destination, and it's oh, and yeah. inexplicably. Over and over again, these people manage to be the most conspicuous finder outers. So, like when they figure out that Damien's the devil, they're never like slick about it. They just like staring at him, like, "Oh, hello, Damien, devil boy." I mean, nothing. And then, like, it's obvious. It's like he doesn't need to have mystical powers. The, to the know weirdest that you thing know. is that they made Damien. He goes to military school. Yeah. And then for oh, some wow. reason, since he's the devil, he has really just good at military expert school. trivia knowledge yeah. on everything related <laughs> to war. And death. So he knows every trivia fact yeah. about war and death. No, about how when people die. Inherently. I almost wondered, I'm like, was the Omen to some sort of like anti-imperialist commentary? Because like he was really good at military school, you know? Um but I don't know. I I don't know if they have any points. It's just, but it's it's so strange to me because I'm like, you know, you think they're continuing these movies, so is the quest that, uh, you know, they're gonna defeat him. <laughs> like, yeah, basically, the Omen Three has Sam Neill as Damien, yeah. and it's basically just a bunch of priests with knives repeatedly trying to assassinate him. <laughs> Before they, Jesus, before like Jesus can be reborn or he wins or something. They do finally defeat him, I think, in the three, kind of, don't they? They, because Jesus. It was so born. bad that <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Jesus is born. Yeah, there's like a new Jesus that's born, so he's yeah, sorted. The second coming. And then the movie just ends with quotes from the Bible. Yeah. So it's oh. like you got to read the book if you want to see what happens. It's a very <laughs> odd turn of ev- it's a very odd turn of events. And then for some inexplicable reason in that movie, there was. A, a graphic hardcore rough sex scene oh my god <laughs> like like very much like my night with the devil <laughs> i don't understand why they put it in there wow no was she i guess i think the character was trying to sleep with him to 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 throw him off the scent that she knew he was the devil but i don't even know if she really thinks that she did that it was very odd, and and it didn't make any sense because is yeah. Damien grown in the Omen Three? Yes, in the Omen Three, he's, he's Sam Neil. He's, he's a young Sam Neil. He's about to become the ambassador 
of England. To, of England for the Ameri- for America. Yeah. So globalism is related right? to. It's not a child. That seems like. Yeah. Like well, what, it's the third know? movie. He's got to grow up. It's the third movie. He's yeah, grown up, and now he's finally about to ascend to his plans, and that. Yeah. Wily old Jesus is coming down to, to <laughs> even though this is what's crazy to me is like what why is it taking so long for the second coming of Christ to happen? <laughs> if all Damien's killed like so many people, and yeah, oh no, no, even better. Earth. So what happens is the second coming of Christ comes, and, and Damien's like, well, I can't have that kill all these babies that were born on the 24th of this date and like literally like a hundred babies are murdered okay by in, by satanists in and stuff. freak accidents and murder and the news is like why are all the babies, babies getting dying. weird deaths this is weird <laughs> this is a strange turn of wow. events this is a sad time and then jesus is finally there as a baby and i'm like bro there is a grown-ass satan son causing havoc why would you have Jesus come down as a helpless child? No, it would be dope. And why wouldn't you protect these a hundred other babies that were murdered? It was just so dark. I was like, is God slacking? Like, what's going on? Like, asleep on the job. Like, oh shit, I'm supposed to send a baby like 30 years ago. <laughs> Oh man, we're late. <laughs> like one How old things kid. Damn it. <laughs> one angel flying around drunk with with Jesus, second coming Jesus, like, oh crap, I forgot. <laughs> I overslept. Flying at the last supper. Shut up, time makes sense. <laughs> so that was half of our Hail Satan Day on day on day six. And nice. the other two movies we saw were technically not satan related but we watched hereditary to it hail Paymon. yes demon related and we watched mandy because they're even they're though satanists. they're talking about jesus they're satan they're satan. <laughs> yeah. they like satan i still haven't seen hereditary that's definitely on my list i want to oh, do that's like a, a creepy uh, kids movie right there you gotta you gotta yeah do. yeah for sure no i want to do like a hereditary midsummer double feature because they're kind of like spiritual sequels sisters or whatever yeah. i don't know that's pretty heavy that's a heavy day for you that's yeah. pretty heavy watch one and then decide if you want to do yeah, that. watch <laughs> one take them out and then watch, watch your interior because they are they are long and they are not playing around they are mind <laughs> that they are mentally like mind fuck you yeah. hereditary is really good mandy mandy's just so such a psychedelic trip and you gotta enjoy Nick Cage, Nick Caging out yeah. like that. That's always fun to watch. Yeah. Always. Um, for let's see, we also watch the others, which is always a great watch. A goth for the Gothic Day. For Gothic Day, um, one of the worst things we watched <laughs> on Gothic Day was we watched 1989's Phantom of the Opera. Starring oh. Robert England, Freddy Hey Kruger. kids, did you know Freddy Krueger wanted to be the Phantom of the Opera? It didn't work out. <laughs> Just it didn't. It was. <laughs> it was so unwatchable. It was. It was just. It was, They they didn't even want to make a Phantom of the Opera movie. They were just trying to make a Freddy Krueger movie. Yeah. And not not get in trouble. So the whole movie takes place there. There's like a. It starts off in New York in the present day. And then this girl goes to a singing audition with her best friend, who's Molly Shannon from SNL in her first movie ever. And uh, and then as she's doing her singing audition, she gets hit on the head by a sandbag. <laughs> and then the rest of the movie is a dream set in Victorian times. Yeah. Where there's a murderous Phantom of the Opera. So in this movie, like, the Phantom of the Opera has ab absolutely no sympathetic qualities he was a like a solieri type musician no he has he made, toiling away he made, in obscurity no he made a faustian pact with a devil yes, because he who was, was toiling por- away who was portrayed by a little person a little person yes oh wow he was toiling away in in obscurity for his music and he wants to be a musician and then so satan 
um, says to him, I will give you the, the ability to be the most talented. People will love you for your music, but nothing else. And then for no reason whatsoever, just mars his face, makes him look like a <laughs> rotting corpse, half a rotting corpse. Half a Freddy Krueger. So then oh he God. decides that he has to skin people and sew their skin onto his face to oh make no. a skin mask. So that he can look like he had plastic surgery. So yeah, he looks kind of <laughs> like 1984. Walter Mercado. <laughs> This is, this is Nightmare on Elm Street. This is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This is everything. <laughs> oh, no, no. And the best part is, like, you know, this is 89. The Phantom of the Opera musical had already come out. So, like, when you sit there, like, I'm going to watch Phantom of the Opera, you're expecting to hear music. They obviously could not get any of the rights to any of the music. So they wrote one terrible song no. that like, sounds a little bit like Angel of Music. That music they play the over night, and over. That they just played over and over again. Then the actress that they cast Can't sing. couldn't act, couldn't sing. So they had someone oh, dub no. over her. And so I'm like, why is she no. even here? They mispronounced oh. Christine's last name. They call her Day instead of Daye. And I was just like, going slowly mad every time they said 15 day i'm like you're in paris they would never say day <laughs> like, like it was so frustrating and it was basically exactly like the phantom of the opera the storyline like you know go into his dungeon and he's gonna teach you how to only sing. every once in a while the phantom would take, take a break, break and, and have sex with a prostitute yeah. and he would then murder but he would then murder and he was just horribly violent and oh my God. it was just so, and like you, you have no sympathy for any and character. For some inexplicable reason, um, who was it that was in this movie? Um, the British guy, what's his name? Oh, no, it was just on the tip of my tongue. Uh, the guy who played Davy Jones. Bill Nye. Bill Nye. Yeah. Is in the oh. middle of this movie, and you can tell he's the best actor yeah. in this movie, even though he just has like. He's like four like passing scenes where he's just talking about the fans. He's one of the financiers of the opera house. Oh. So it's and I I don't think I've ever been more frustrated watching a movie so closely based on Phantom of the Opera, the musical, but not having any music. Like all yeah. I want every five seconds I was humming with every change of scene, I was just humming like na 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 and I was like, but it's never gonna happen. It was so frustrating. And then somehow she ends up back in modern times. Oh, yeah, she recovers from her head injury. But wait, it wasn't just a dream. Because inexplicably, he's still alive and he's a murderer still. It was so bad there. It was so bad. It was not great. Yeah. And then it, it played exactly like a Freddy movie. Like someone fell asleep. Mm -hmm. Freddy was in it. You wake up. Freddy's there, and then, oh, wait, Freddy is evil. Yeah. He does rip his face off. Yeah. What's going on? We're not going to explain anything. It's just happening. <laughs> oh. It was, yeah. it was rough. It was so rough. Um, so that could be a good transition to, so musicals with not enough music. Um, I actually, like, so, what was it, yesterday, I think, I watched, um, I kind of took a break from my genre challenge because there was a couple, there was like Sea Creature Day and Cannibal Day and I was like, I don't really care that much about either of those things. <laughs> I don't want to so, eat anyone. I, yesterday I ended up doing a hybrid horror double feature. Um, the first movie I watched was um, an Iranian vampire western, which I don't know who called this movie a western, but it's... it's <laughs> It was. It's called A Girl Walks Home at Night. It's on Shutter. Oh, you yeah, um, yeah. It was interesting. It was. It was very deliberate and very nuanced. Maybe a little bit too much. So it starts to get overindulgent at some point. Like, like this movie would have. If if this movie, if you cut out all of the staring into the middle distance in this movie, it would be like <laughs> twenty minutes long. I swear to God. <laughs> There was a, a Joe Bob Briggs special with with this with this movie in it, and I saw it then for that, and I loved it. 
that night. But it, I could tell that it's the type of movie that, like, it just is very art house in its yeah. in its style. That it it's is. the type of movie that, like, you see once and you're like impressed by, and yeah. then like you're probably never gonna <laughs> watch it. Uh, yeah, and it's just it's like there were times when it did, didn't feel like cohesive enough or like there are times when i like was confused and like it like there was not like a very strong sense of coherence mm -hmm. and i was kind of like why is this happening and like it but anyway it was it was interesting i would i would probably watch it again just to be like let me make sure and see like what what i what i actually saw here for some uh, reason i thought it was very tarantino-esque really There's something about it there's, I mean, the, there's, definite, like, there's like definite Sergio Leone influences, I feel like, in some parts. I like what they did with the music, too. The music was interesting, like all the like Iranian new wave and stuff like that, I thought was really cool. Um, but anyway, getting back to the point that I was kind of taking a long walk to get to was I also watched the zombie musical... Anna and the Apocalypse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, oh, my God, I love this movie so much. <laughs> <laughs> How so, I know that you would so love that campy movie. and ridiculous and beautiful. I just And like, you can like, watch it at Christmas. My only complaint actually was that there's not enough. There, were, there was, like, at least one or two times where I was like, oh, my God, please break in the song. Please break in the song. And they did yeah. And I was so pissed. But it was so beautiful and campy and delicious, and I loved it. I loved it so much. We watched that movie once. Steven watched it. And then, like, and then for years. a few weeks ago. No, it was like we watched it like the beginning of the year or something like that. Then a few weeks ago, he's like, oh, let's watch Anna the, and the Apocalypse. And I'm like, but we've seen that movie. And he's like, no, we haven't. And I'm like, yes, we have, Stephen. And he's like, no, we haven't. I have never seen that movie. So we put it on, and like, I like he he cannot remember his first showing of this film. Nope. But I'm telling you, he watched it. So he he watched it twice. I got neuralized. I don't he know. He did. He got completely neuralized. But I know that we watched it, and so it was so like this is you know, deeper, like ever, you know. You've been in quarantine too long when you forget an entire movie even happened to you like <laughs> i blocked it out maybe i wasn't ready for christmas i think you fell asleep know. and then i think you fell asleep towards the end and then that's what was wrong and your mind erased it when you fell mm. asleep. but I, I liked it too i was very impressed um when i watched it because i i think the music was better than i was expecting it to be yeah, it's like an amateur musical, but it's actually yeah. pretty good. For no, it's cute. It's cute, though. I like it. And I, yeah. I think it, it's got a lot of fun beats to it. And, yeah. I That's, like the, the bully. The, the place where I lost it with this movie was that song that she sings when she wakes up in the morning and she, like, bounds out of her house and she's like, it's a new day! And yeah. there's, like, people running from zombies behind her and shit. Oh, my God. I was fucking dying. That was that was great. That was a good time. That's there is a lot of like Shaun of the Dead in it with the like things going on and he's not noticed that, that that iconic scene where he slips in the blood and doesn't even realize like what's happening. It's it it fills a very great niche of Christmas British <laughs> horror movie. Yeah, it like creates its own niche of like zombie musical Christmas movie. <laughs> it's like that's like so many things I like. So like, of course, how could I not like this movie? I, I love Christmas. I appreciate when people try to do horror musicals because they're so rare nowadays. They're rare in general, but like, I really like it when people try. I mean, there's, there's no. I don't know if there's two more diametrically opposed, like diametrically on the opposite end of the spectrum of like human experience than like a horror movie and a musical <laughs> just like in the tone like you can see it you can see the way like it was and it's and that's that's kind of impressive the way that they were able to like 
keep the balance between the tone of a musical versus the tone of a horror movie and like the drama that's happened. They get really, like, they do a really good job with the drama of like people seeing their loved ones turn into zombies and like they're crushed by it and like, but then it goes into like the action, the fucking song of the, the like asshole douche boy with his bat <laughs> and his <friend. laughs> His aggro attack. Yeah. Oh my God, that was great. But yeah, it, it balances a lot of things and does it like in a pretty a pretty good way and, and you know, has a lot of fun with it, which I, I really like. I thought you repo the genetic opera, right? You thought. I, I, I think Satya showed it to me. Oh. Um, but yeah, no, I, I wait, no, no, she showed, she showed me um, Dr. Horrible. I always get those confused. Oh, okay. I actually haven't seen Repo. That's something that I need to check I out. I recommend Repo the Genetic Opera because it is batshit and amazing and I love it. Yeah. So. No, I mean, that's like right up my, I mean, batshit musical, like, uh, you, uh, I'm sold already. So. We watched a movie that could not pick its tone for um, our anthology, Jay. We watched this 1971 movie called The House That Drip Blood <laughs> that oh. is uh, sort of done by some of the Hammer Horror actors. Okay. Um, so there was a, a piece with Peter Cushing and a piece with uh, Anthology Story with Christopher Lee. And it turns out when they made this movie, they wrote it as a comedy. And then the producers decided that they wanted it to be scary. Yeah halfway through shooting the movie <laughs> so there are some shorts that you can tell like were comedic and they're like trying to edit it to be yeah. less funny but because it's still really funny you can tell that it's a com <laughs> the, the comedy ones because when the actors die they make the funniest british faces yeah. they're just like they cross their eyes they die like ooh, like crossing their eyes and like their mouths are like this the ridiculous goofy shape of like Ooh, no, hold up. and then almost <laughs> every story had somebody with like ridiculous teeth in yes, their mouth as the, bad as the villains <laughs> like that is the symbol and then the irony that the movie's called the house that drip blood and there's zero blood, blood in this in movie yeah, there's, zero there's blood. no gore none it's all jokes yep it's all people <laughs> falling over it's it all kept, choking it kept reminding me every time a bad guy appeared with bad teeth it just kept reminding me of that simpsons joke the big book of british smiles like <laughs> laughing we watched a really good anthology horror movie called ghost stories that's Ooh, on that hulu right now movie, yeah. that was really really fantastic and scary and scary <laughs> and what i loved about it the most is that it works as both an anthology movie and it sort of works as like a standalone film very, oh, cool. very, very seamlessly yeah so I highly so, recommend Ghost Stories on Hulu. Huh? So there's like some cohesion to it, like a thread. Yes, yeah. yeah. It all, all, it all ties together at the end. See, that's the best kind of anthology. Like you know, like if you're gonna do an anthology, I feel like it just enhances it times a hundred. If there's like some kind of common thread running well, through it. Blood tried to do that, but it was basically just like a cop. But it was basically two you, cops yeah. just telling stories, stories to, to each other. This house is evil, I tell you. Even though everything people are doing has nothing to do so with the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, the house is strange. But anyway, he was in London. And the crimes <laughs> like, happened there. Miles away from the house. <laughs> the house is problem? Like, so, good transition to from a movie that promises blood and has none to, so for my psychological day, I watched two movies. The first was uh, this, this Netflix movie called Apostle, which I, like, I didn't, I'd never seen it. I didn't really know that much about it. So, like, the, the way that I decided that this was psychological was I Googled psychological movies and that was like on the list so i was like okay i'll do it that day this movie is so relentless in its brutality in its physical violence in its other kinds of violence like torture and like 
it's about this like community that has like kind of cordoned themselves off on this island so that they can live it's like this like cult uh-huh. that uh like has cordoned themselves on this island so that they can live however they want to live and there's a prophet who they all like worship but like for people who like screw up or don't like you know live up to their standards they have all of these like horrific punishments and like there's like a rack that they strap this one guy to and like drill like a crank drill like drills into the top of his head and like you 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 pretty much see it so it's like really it's really interesting actually because I watched this the ne- it was the next day but the movie I saw before this on my true story day was this movie called Lords of Chaos which is also very um very overindulgent in violence. Um, but for me at least, so so Lords of Chaos is like as is a dramatization of the events of basically like the founding and kind of this this uh story of this circle of people who kind of founded the Norwegian black metal scene. And so there's like, you know, and they, they, they are so into like being true, quote unquote, true black metal that they get into like, they start like burning churches, they start like, you know, murdering people and like doing all this stuff that's like evil, you know, Um, and it was interesting to me because I... I don't know if this is necessarily like the target audience for this movie or not because it's such a f- small, small, small niche. But I am one of a very few people who actually was like already familiar with a lot of the events that this movie kind of portrays because I had a friend in, uh, huh? This is a true story? Yeah, it's true. Oh, it's all true. Goodness. Yeah super fucked up, which is part of the reason why I think they were so overindulgent in the violence. And, but the main reason I think, and so this, which goes back to my friend in the early 2000s who got me really into all of this black metal that he was really into. And a big part of the ethos of a lot of that, a lot of those black metal bands and the black metal scene was they didn't want to be popular. Like they wanted to make music that <clears throat> most people wouldn't like. That was like purposely inaccessible I to <laughs> most. Well, I'm not. No, I never showed you any of this. Like this. This is beyond the stuff that I've showed you. The screaming and craziness. Like this is like they they would record it poorly on purpose. They would like it was it was it was a it was a full on aesthetic of like this is cult this is like the 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 you know the, the only the true true black metal you know cult people will appreciate this music and the musicianship isn't always there and so like and but so I thought it was interesting that this movie was so indulgent in the violence because it kind of does um, keep with that ethos of, we want this movie to be almost unwatchable by most people. Like, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's, I, I honestly think that's probably what they were going for because it, it depicts all of the violence so graphically there's a scene with uh, wh- where uh, the original singer of the band Mayhem, which is like the original, like, you know, probably the quintessential like Norwegian black metal band, their original singer commits suicide graphically as fuck. Like, I don't, I don't know if we even want to like, <laughs> I even want to yeah. say it on the yeah, podcast. Not, yeah. But he Suffice like. Suffice to say, really gross. <laughs> 
Suffice to say, he does a number on himself. <laughs> and um, they show all of it, like, graphically. And it's like, damn, it's so indulgent. But I really feel like it's kind of in keeping with that ethos of, like, no, we're going to show you exactly what happened, and you're going to either fucking watch it or you're going to turn it off. And if you turn it off, all the better, because fuck you for not, you know, not being true black metal or whatever. But the story is so fucked up, and I was familiar with it a little bit. But basically, the, the culmination of the movie is um, these two members of the same band start like arguing over you know one of them kind of was doing this to cultivate an image and the other one is like doing it for real with you know because he's a sociopath basically yeah because all this is like so insane so he ends up going to the guy's apartment and stabbing him 23 times uh because he thought he says he did it in self-defense because he thought this guy was going to, like, tase him and, like, torture and kill him and film it for for the promotion of an album, you know? Like, <laughs> but it's just so... It was really interesting for me as somebody who has heard these stories before. I don't know how many people that have he... who and can watch this movie have it's heard these stories. It was on, it's on Hulu. Hulu. Wow. It, it was on, it used yeah, to be it came on. It like two Shutter. years ago. Yeah. It came out two years ago. It was based on a book that one of these guys wrote, which is also called Lords of Chaos. And I feel like I appreciate it in a way that most people probably don't, just because most people are not really familiar with a lot of this stuff. It sounds and, like if you walked into this without knowing anything about it, you'd just be like, what is this gratuitous torture porn that I'm yeah. put on? Like, I think, I mean, that that's a good point, actually. Like, it, it's pro it probably is, you know, it's for an audience of people who either, A, are familiar with all this stuff and just want to see it and are going to watch it, B, people that stumble across it and are completely disgusted and turn it off, and that's part of the desired reaction they want, I think. Or see people who stumble across it and are like really into it and like oh and like they're they're true cult they're you know we got we got some new ones and you know like um, so yeah that was an interesting experience uh, I, that that was a movie that I, I watched it really late at night which I kind of felt like was appropriate but I started watching it at like eleven thirty oh, no. and stayed up until like one one thirty in the morning and. This is the first time in a while that I was actually kind of legitimately scared that I was going to have nightmares because yeah. it's just graphic. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, luckily, but that movie, I can't say that I would recommend it necessarily <laughs> um, unless you're really into like graphic torture porn I or. Martyrs. I can't say I'd recommend the movie Martyrs. Uh, yeah. Like. I about that movie. Oh yeah, I would never recommend that movie to anybody. If you yeah. watch it, good for you. Have fun with that. Right, exactly. It's, yeah. it's, it's honest, experience. It sounds honestly very similar to how Martyrs is, except Martyrs, it, as far as I know, hopefully, Christ is not based on any reality because it's. But it's just it's the same kind of thing. It's just a constant barrage of brutal torture and violence yeah. and in the, the most graphic way possible um i mean the director Adm I, I thought that the director and the people that made the the um the stuff was they were gonna do like a a remake of something like predator or aliens i don't know i thought that, i thought that they were working on something and i got really excited because i thought that they would do it justice but i don't know whatever came in mm -hmm. the, the effects in that movie are so absolutely just devastatingly disturbing and yeah wow. it came out of that whole that whole era of french horror that just right. seemed to be like hey do you want to just be uncomfortable and miserable for an hour and a half here you go oh. <laughs> the director of that movie was pascal legue 
and he did more French movies. Yeah, well, I thought he was gonna and do a it. tall man movie. No, he didn't do anything else. Oh, okay, I thought he was gonna do a remake of something really popular at one point. Yeah. Incident at Ghostland. <laughs> Well, anyway, so yeah, that's I did that for True Story. And I also I also watched both the two original The Hills Have Eyes movies, which is interesting Have because one and two I was not as impressed by the original Hills Have Eyes as I thought I would be. It was still great. I liked it a lot. Uh, I, I really liked that they have the Act Three set in the morning because I think that works really well. Like. They're in the desert, so like daytime is actually scarier in yeah. a way than nighttime in the desert. So it works really well, I think, to have that third act set in the morning. I watched the remake and it traumatized me. I heard the remake is good. I want to see that it's, too. I I would argue good or bad, but I think it's yeah. just because like that kind of. I think I have a real problem with an overuse of sexual violence in horror. Oh, yeah, that's... Where yeah. It, that's an... When I tell you there is an extremely long and uncomfortable sexual violence scene in that movie several mm-hmm. times, I have a problem. Like, I just... I'm one of those people who's like, if a horror movie is just making me feel like this could just happen to someone and I hate everything, I don't know how much I want to, like, put myself through that like if the story is good it's enough effective horror but <laughs> i don't want to watch it so who cares it because it, it feels it starts to feel less like horror that is trying to tell me a story and it's more just like hey you want to see how many times we can make you feel like this is really terrible shit that happens to people and like you want to die inside here you go watch this movie and i'm just like <laughs> I think horror i think horror is not at its best when it's exclusively trying to provoke a response yeah you know like just trying to provoke like a not and not just like specifically trying to provoke a negative response yeah trying to provoke bad feelings in somebody like there there's got to be more to it than that like I, I i and when you said that i thought of i can't remember which i think it's the remake of The House at the End of the Street with Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah, oof. Like, really, like, way too graphic rape scene that is just, like, why have this? I remember watching, like, like it was, like, over 10 years ago when I was, like, nowhere near as, you know, critical of things like that as I am now. And even then, I was like, this is way too much. Yeah. I, I can't, I don't like it. I like the original Wes Craven Hills Have Eyes. Yeah. Because it's it's very much like a rip off Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it's through the Wes Craven prism of like what would happen to wholesome people if they meet the most unwholesome people right. that yeah. they could find. Like it's it's a very bare bones horror plot. Yeah, the like the the, the kind of like dichotomy like like complete at opposite ends of the spectrum of like depravity and wholesomeness you know yeah so that i i think that's good i i don't i don't remember the hills have eyes too it's forgettable <laughs> it, it wasn't as bad that was that's the thing like the hills have eyes i think i had high expectations for and they weren't quite met but i still really liked it the Hills Have Eyes 2 wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, but it's still bad. <laughs> it's still not very good. And there's a couple of like, there, there's like, they have, because they have like a token black character. So there's a couple of like pretty racist, like one of the, what, one of the white friends makes a, you stay out in the sun too long, Joe. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no. Really uh... And then there's even the worse one later where the black guy's black girlfriend accuses him of being like too anxious about his surroundings because of the the trauma of growing up in the ghetto basically <laughs> it's really like wow <laughs> you like very obviously a white person wrote oh, this yeah. or a black person to say and it's like pretty gross 
Yeah. Um, but it wasn't, other than that, it wasn't as bad as I expected it, but it was just, like, forgettable. We saw some bad sequels with, uh, on our Drac Attack Day. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dracula 2000, which is produced by Wes Craven, um, I which I really like. excited about the soundtrack for that movie. <laughs> like all this like new metal and shit, right? Yeah. yeah, and it ends with uh with Lincoln Park. It does, yes. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. It's it's, it's stacked. Um, that's one of the things that I loved about the Blair Witch 2. It is also very very late 90s and this like there's like system of a down songs in it and shit like it's like right. really cool. I love cool. it. And I had no idea that Dracula 2000 had two DVD sequels. Yes. Starring everyone's favorite Mowgli, Jason Scott Lee. Oh, I was so excited because Jason Scott Lee, I was both excited and extremely disappointed because they set up Jason Scott Lee as a hot priest who fights vampires. Obviously, so obviously ripping off Blade. It's like they're not so even trying funny. to be Blade. Like they're so trying to be Blade. They just hired a different minority actor, and it was like really frustrating for me because I'm like, but he's so cool, so I'll give it a chance. But then I thought for a split second that this movie was actually going to be interesting and make him Dracula, and mm. I got so I can one can only say mm-hmm. horny and excited. I was like, Jason Scott Lee is Dracula. My life is complete. And then I was like, but they didn't make him Dracula. But do you know when they made him Dracula, Derek? They made him Dracula in the last two minutes of the third film at the end. Okay, now he's Dracula. And do you think they made a Dracula 4? They surely didn't. They deprived me of Jason Scott Lee as Dracula. And that's very upsetting to me that they did that. It sounds like the people who made these movies just hate women. Like, <laughs> well, they, well, Dracula 2000 actually has a very The Rise of Skywalker. It ends like The Rise ending. of Skywalker. Or should I say The Rise of Skywalker ends like Dracula 2000, which is worse. Which is worse. Which is worse. <laughs> so, that, so that movie ends and it's like, I'm Mary Van Helsing Kelsey. and I got Dracula's corpse and I'm going to protect it. And I've got and Dracula's I'm gonna blood in me. And I'm going to save the world. Yeah. I'm going to save the world. And then the next two movies are like, who said that? No one said that. These movies are still going. She's not even in the movies and any of the sequels at all. Never mentioned again. None of it is mentioned again. Instead, Dracula's corpse is found by medical students. Even better. They they decided to doctor. They decided to doctor who Dracula. So every time he's reborn, he looks different. (laughs) <laughs> so they can recast with impunity and just not worry about it. Yeah, so in the, in the third Dracula film, even better, Dracula is played by Rutger Hauer. A Rutger Hauer who I will tell you was there on set for perhaps a day because he was. No, he had a fight scene two days. He had two days. He had. He was in five minutes of that movie. The rest of the movie was them driving around in Romania talking about Dracula, but never seeing Dracula ever. Did you ever want to see a Romanian road story between... Jason Scott Lee and Jason Lee. London? Yeah. Now you got to watch Dracula 2. The Dracula 3, 3. Legacy. Legacy. There you go. Dracula 2 was Ascension, and then Dracula 3 was Legacy. And, and, then, and then they apparently made these movies back to back, so Dracula 2 just ends with a, a huge, huge cliffhanger. cliffhanger. No. And they're like, you better buy that next DVD. <laughs> you better get Dracula 3 or you're not going to know what's going on. No. <laughs> it was so goofy. And, and what's yeah. insane is that the same director that did the original Dracula 2000 made all of these movies. Yes. Oh, wow. Uh... Instead of having a career, <laughs> he had three <laughs> Dracula movies. <laughs> But, like, you don't understand. It gets so disappointing. She sets up the excitement that Jason Scott Lee is Dracula. Because those are like, Dracula. They're like, oh, shit, Dracula. And he looks like Gerard Butler. He's looks, wearing a big coat. A big coat. He's got the He's long, got the sexy hair. hair. He's oh. got the menacing face. He's like, it's like, you're like, oh, snap. And then at the last second, he pulls out the little priest thing and he puts it in his Put neck. It on, and he's a priest. 
He's a priest that gets bitten by a vampire and spends two movies fighting his vampirism until finally, at the end of the last movie, they give me two seconds of my fantasy and make him a Dracula, and then they say, bye, screw you, you don't get to see any more of that, bye. Like, and yeah, they absolutely hate women, because in the first Dracula- They got him shirtless. They made Dracula so hot in Dracula 2000, okay? And all she can do is run around going, Oh no, Dracula, no, leave me alone. Like, bitch, you're a liar. You're a liar. Get out of here. Please. <laughs> I was just like, if that was Dracula and I had a force bond with Dracula, it would be over for me. I would just be like, well, this is what happened. I'm in love with Dracula now, I guess. <laughs> like, I just got They don't even go back to the force bonds. <laughs> I've just got a Dracula myself. Because, like, seriously, if Gerard Butler showed up wearing, like, nothing except a coat and a smile, and was like, I'm Dracula. I'm like, all right. <laughs> all right, then. You we, are Dracula. We also watch Christopher Lee in The Horror of Dracula. We watch a lot of Christopher Lee movies. Yeah. Right. I've never seen a Christopher Lee Dracula. I need to do that. Well, there are plenty. <laughs> he, plenty. he played Dracula more than anybody, and yeah. there's over 10 Dracula films. And Peter Cushing like, always plays like someone, get, like his rival or something. Oh, yeah. You know, they were best friends. It's really cute. Nice. Um, so that was a, a good watch. Yeah. Um, what else is on your list? Um, the there I only have one more movie that I was gonna talk about and I was gonna talk about it for a little while. So if you have anything left. Okay. So one of the movies that for some reason came to my brain on our animation day is this um is this nineties a uh, Halloween special that was animated that they did. That's oh, yeah. called a Halloween tree. That's based on a book by Ray Bradbury. Nice. Um, which totally got me in the nostalgia feels. Like the animation's yeah. a lot worse it's than Man I remember it. The animation's not yeah. as good as I remember it, but it's a definitely a spooky story. Like there's a couple of moments where you kind of cringe at how they sort of whitewash people's histories a little bit. Yeah. Um, because the story's kind of about they like lose their friend gets his soul stuck in a pumpkin that's in the Halloween tree. <laughs> when you say like that, it's so funny. His friend's sold in a pumpkin. <laughs> and it's Halloween and they're all dressed up in their costumes and then there's a spooky guy played by Leonard Nimoy whose name is Professor Mountroud <laughs> and he wants this soul in the pumpkin and this kid is appearing as a ghost and his name is Pip and everyone loves Pip. He's like the greatest boy who ever lived. And when they go to Pip's house, Pip's getting taken to the hospital and they're depressed. And then this old man like whisks them away and then they start traveling through time and space. To learn about different Halloweens. To learn about the origins of their Except costumes. my problem becomes that like they kept calling Dia de los Muertos Mexican Halloween. Oh, which no. is not Mexican Halloween at all. But I think that's one of the reasons why people have a problem to this day. <laughs> Keep calling it Mexican but they're Halloween. Very, they're very reverential about how it's they're, Mexican they, Halloween. They, they do, yeah, they show you the actual like cultural <laughs> traditions, but they just continue to call it Mexican Halloween. Like at one point, the little boy goes, Mexican Halloween's great. <laughs> like, I'm like, stop it. Stop calling it Mexican Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> and then they also show like Egyptian stuff. And then that inspired Danny to build her own Halloween tree. So oh yeah, I did a really clay. Cool. I did a clay oh, nice. of the Halloween tree. Yeah, yeah, so. I've spent four days feverishly constructing a clay Halloween tree. I need to do some like crafty or like some kind of something other than watching movies for Halloween because I want to do some some fun stuff. So we also had fun on uh, Teacher Trouble was one of our days. Mm -hmm. oh, no. Um, yeah. And we went ham on that day and saw The Faculty. It's a horrible 80s movie called Full Moon High that was a, oh, so bad. a werewolf, like, Jewish That's comedy. Pitt, right? Huh? That's the Brad Pitt one, right? No, 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 no. Full Moon High is starring um, Alan Alda's son, or is that his name? Yeah, right? Yeah, right. And he's in it with his son oh, okay. alan arkin alan arkin's son okay. alan arkin and his son are in it and it's just horrible it's like a, it's a parody of like werewolf movies and like high school movies right 
um, Cutting Class was the Brad the Pitt movie we saw, which is so 80s. <laughs> And it's so 80s to the detriment of itself because like it's one of those things where nowadays they would totally possibly make it so that like the person you think isn't the villain is the villain right. and then the person mm-hmm. that seems like the villain isn't but not not then <laughs> you straight- I'm like I-, I was watching the movie and I'm like Danny that guy's an asshole yeah. that guy has to be the villain Brad Pitt's and she's kid. like no, it's the 80s. Yeah. That's the cool guy. Yeah, yeah. and I was right. <laughs> he's like physically abused. Like he's possessive and he's like jealous and he like grabs up on her. And like, but yet for whatever reason, the sensitive boy who escaped the mental hospital is a freak because he stares. Oh, <laughs> it's like, he does a lot of stalking. He does do a lot of stalking. Nobody's a winner in this But movie. I thought it was going to be like a sort of like say anything type of Lloyd Dobler style I thought stalking, it was going to be a know? thing where like he's like stalking her because he knows Brad Pitt is the serial yeah. killer and he's trying to like find a way to, to talk her. to her. Even no. though that's still questionably creepy. At least there's a reason why he's just staring <laughs> into the middle distance all the time. Yeah. But it's not a reason. He's a serial murderer, and that's it. That's the end of the movie. That's wow. It. And that was fun. That was on Showtime. Um, any other... Have I? Hit? That was Brad Pitt's debut role, by the way. Uh, yeah, I've heard that. And then, uh, finally, for today, we had our theme was Good Witch, and we watched Practical Magic and The Witches of Eastwick. Some classic films from David Youth. Yes. Nice. Okay. So, always recommend this. Yes. Cool, what yeah. What do you got left? What's your last choice? The So, my last one was this <clears throat> also on Psychological Day. I had a, 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 I had a little bit of a run there with uh, Lords of Chaos being the last movie I watched the day before I had my Psychological Day. And then I watched that gruesome Apostle movie first thing on on psychological day and then i finished psychological day with my second viewing of uh robert eggers the lighthouse which is an excellent excellent movie and um what i love about this movie um and it may be that i'm reading a little bit too far into the source text but I, I, I really feel like there's a lot there to support this sort of hypothesis of mine that this movie, to me, seems to be all about power dynamics and the way that power dynamics show up in the world, um, specifically with, <clears throat> you know, seeing like <clears throat> the portrayal of what a a powerless person will do when they are given a modicum of power over somebody else, the ways that they will use and abuse that power uh, just to kind of prove to themselves that they can um, when they've when they've had so much experience in their life of being powerless but also this kind of overarching sense of both of these characters are ultimately on the powerless side. And they, the reason that they are driven to, you know, the, the, that the, the person with the modicum of power is driven to abuse it. And that that drives the, the person that he's abusing to kind of fight back and, uh, and, you know, pushes him to to the limit of his sanity to where he ultimately like murders him basically <clears throat> is that they both been left behind by the boat and the boat to me is kind of the symbol of the true power in society that has left all of us behind but grants a grants a certain few of us a little bit of power in order to keep the kind of order of society that, that that is in their best interest um going 
so that with the so that the and to also to play people against each other so that they'll they won't focus on the fact that the people in true power have kind of left us all behind much in the way that the boat has because the boat is supposed to come after three weeks and they wait for it and it never shows up so they're kind of marooned by this boat and so it's kind of like you know they've been left behind by the only like apparatus in this whole movie that actually has any real power and so I don't know if that's you know that might be reading a little too far into the source text I know I've talked to some other people that were like what I didn't get that at all from this movie but I was just focusing on how gay it was oh yeah <laughs> I mean yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, like I mean I don't mean that like in an insulting way I oh, mean like, no. I'm like this movie's homoerotic and it I know that like very, Edward, yeah. um Robert Iger. Robert Iger was very specifically ta- like he made the homoerotic subtext very oh, awful, yeah. not subtext. <laughs> not, <laughs> not subtle, yeah, no, for sure. I mean the, I mean not even just with the like repeated masturbation and all that, but like you know with the the scenes where they're like drinking and dancing and then they like slow dance together <laughs> and they're I, like. I do. Know, I do yes. see. I do, just as a, a different interpretation, I do see power mm-hmm. dynamics at play in their relationship, which yeah. I, I do, like, I, I kind of saw, especially, I think, from what I can remember, it's been a while now, but I, from what I remember, like, you know, he, I think he had some issues with a parent figure, I think his father figure at some point, Robert Pattinson's character, and I don't know, or I could, t- I, I, I think maybe I inferred that, so it mm-hmm. kind of almost seemed like the way that he looked at Willem Dafoe's character in this sort of strange incestuous sexual Mm. kind of like way which I think goes into your argument about power dynamics because he was filling in all these kinds of roles for him you know and and all these kinds of and all this place kind of put his anger I think because he's sort of angry at him from the get he's kind of like doesn't want to deal with him doesn't want to be friends and it's kind of like Willem that's like, no, you have to talk. We have to communicate here or you're going to go nuts. And yeah, then like, gaslights him the whole time is yeah. like, really, like horrible. <laughs> yeah, but like, it's like you can tell, like you can see how like his character, Robert Pattinson's character, well, I can't remember anybody's name. It doesn't matter. Um, like you can see how he just very much like is trying so hard to keep himself contained because there's so much sort of like rage and frustration bubbling up inside of him. And mm-hmm. like, I think that goes into, again to your argument about power dynamics because he feels so utterly powerless, like this job that he's doing where he's basically stranded on an island for however many weeks running a light. Yeah. You know? and, and, they, and they talk about, he, he talks about how... <clears throat> You know, before this, he was in like Timber, and he the reason that he started doing the lighthouse thing was that he, I think he like read somewhere that because it's such backbreaking work that you can earn way more money, and he yeah. wanted to earn that money to, you know, buy a plot of land and like settle down with a wife. It's very like American dream. Which is all, which also kind of plays into the whole power dynamics theme. This idea of like forcing people into backbreaking labor so that they can, you know, pull, you know, pull themselves up by their bootstraps and, you know, get the get the house with the white picket fence and the two point three children. Yeah, and and they're like you said, they're so far removed from society, but yet, like when you think of what a lighthouse is, a lighthouse is, is it's critical to ships because they will crash on them rocks and die. But like, what, what are they mostly, what is, what are they so dependent on? They're dependent on moving goods with those ships. So it's like so far removed from society, like they're so isolated, but yet society is dependent on them to keep that lighthouse going so that they can move their their goods back and forth. And it, 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 there is, I do see that there. Like I, I think a lot. You focus a lot on the interpersonal when you're watching that movie, just because it's so intimate between the two characters. But I could totally see a higher, like a a different reading where you're focused on like the outside. 
Yeah, I mean, and they, and to that point, that's a good point, like, the, they are very, very much cogs in the capitalist system, like, in the, in the truest sense of the word, they are basically machinery to keep the to keep capitalism going by you know having the maintaining the lighthouse so that all this shipping can happen that's a really good point i think i i just really enjoyed how like visually unique and stylized and like it Absolutely. knows exactly what it's trying to do yeah. like there's never a moment where you feel any like uncertainty about like that they just made up this shot in the movie. Like, That's what I like about I like about his movies is that he's just a very confident filmmaker. Like very he deliberate. doesn't like he does, yeah, he's very deliberate. He doesn't make you know, he 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 plans all of his his, his <clears throat> sort of like what he wants to achieve with his movies. So like they're quiet they can be very quiet, but hey. they're very tight. Mm -hmm. And he knows where he's going, you know? Yeah. And like the like I mean for for example like the the 35 millimeter black and white camera could easily have been a gimmick if yeah. it wasn't used to a specific purpose and in this case it was very much used to a specific purpose it really emphasizes and heightens this sense of claustrophobia yeah. in this movie so much and like the black and white too, like really like the 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 you know like tones kind of blend together a little bit more in black and white. So there's this sense of everything being very closed in, and like especially with like you know, and especially especially seeing it like in a movie theater, seeing the square and the two like blocks of black on the sides gives it such a claustrophobic feeling that like really enhances the claustrophobic feeling of the movie. And I have to say like a lot, sometimes with black and white movies, they can make you feel kind of removed emotionally mm. from the stuff that's going on. And I never felt like that in that movie. Oh, yeah. It felt very visceral and in your face. Well, I think part of it too, is that the movie kind of like, since it has like farting and it has like all of these <laughs> like, really like yeah like childish modern. gross things like it that that story element kind of like like the, gets into your core yeah. in a way you know what i mean it gets into a very like no it's, it's kind of like when you're sitting there watching that and you have the guy farting you're like how am i gonna like what is this movie gonna be about if yeah, this is like the beginning of this film kind of like walking oh. up like it's just sort of like like but, it contributes to this sort of sense of this guy as somebody who like doesn't deserve to be in charge for any reason whatsoever. <laughs> He's just a like slovenly slob, and but like and also like that that kind of goes to another point about like you know for a black and white movie, this movie has a lot of like tonal color there's a lot of like there's a lot of like richness in this movie that like and, it, and part of it is like you know you know black and white has come a long way since like the original black and this is a very vivid very like high definition kind of yeah. black and white that really pulls you into the story and there's so much going, like, I mean, then, you know, the mermaid and all this, there's, like, so much going on that brings a different kind of color to the movie that it's, like, really, it, it, it never, it never, it never feels distant in that way that a black and white movie sometimes can. I think we nailed it. We landed that fart noise. There we go. <laughs> Um, anything uh, you're looking forward to tomorrow? Looking forward to what's tomorrow? What's my day for uh, tomorrow? I think tomorrow's slasher day, so that could go in a lot of directions. I think I'm probably gonna do prom night for slasher day, uh, because I've never seen the original prom night. Um, I think I'm gonna do uh, trick or treat, is another one that I've never seen that supposedly is also a slasher. I don't know because I've never seen it, but, um, and, well, what I'm really excited for, though, Sunday 
is my B movie day, and I am just gonna I'm I'm just gonna wake up and start watching B movies. Like start with like Snakes on a Plane or something like that, and just like go all fucking day. It's gonna be a fucking ride. I can't wait. Sweet. I have been your host, Stephen. I have been me, Jan- Danny Danielle. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you love it. Rock world heavyweight champion of scares and spooks and uh things that go bump in the night. Check us out on Twitter at Vundacast. Um, check us out at Vundablog.com. Um, and remember kids, when you eventually do your time in a lighthouse, make sure to just kill the person on the first day. Like whoever you're working with, yes. just murder them. Great. Just kill the hearts. Just you, you don't need to endure that. You don't need to endure that subjugation. You've seen the movie. You've seen what happens. Amazing. Hey, Wonder. Hey, Wonder. Wondercast. Give yeah. it up for Wondercast, man. What an adorable name. You're listening to the Wondercast. What's up, everybody? This is JC David Frank, Green Ranger. You're listening to Boondocast. to the Vondacast.